Jillian's story. For the thousandth time, I want to apologize, Tracy. I know we will have another shower in Connecticut, but I wish I had gone to Georgia this time. I missed my oldest daughter's first baby shower because I attended the mandatory quarterly meeting at the home office of the insurance company, my agency represented in Connecticut. My father founded our firm almost 40 years ago, and I was to take the reins when he officially retired in the next couple years. And for the thousandth time, Mom, don't worry about it. The shower you're taking in two weeks will come soon enough. I can't wait to get back to Connecticut to see all my old friends. Tracy contacted me via video link from her home outside of Atlanta, and my husband Chris contacted me from our home in Farmington, Connecticut. I was in my Marriott hotel room in Charlotte, North Carolina. Ah, we can't wait for you to come home, Tracy. How are the meetings going, Jilly? Chris asked me. As always, there's a lot of great material, and I've taken some key takeaways to implement over the next quarter. But I don't understand why American Insurance insists that these meetings must take place in person. The meetings could easily be held online. The cost savings to each agency would be substantial. Like most large companies, they are stuck in their ways, Tracy replied, while Chris added, American Insurance has to justify the $15 million cost of the training and conference center they built just before the COVID pandemic. What are the boys doing this weekend, and why aren't they at our weekly family meeting? I wanted to know. The boys are vacationing in a cabin in Vermont. I talked to them last night. They are with a small group of friends. They plan to climb to the top of Mount Mansfield today, Chris explained. However, being in Vermont doesn't exempt them from our weekly calls. We installed internet in the cabin over a decade ago. This is the third week in a row they've neglected their family obligations. If you don't want to talk to them, I will. Be my guest, was Chris's quick and surprisingly sarcastic reply. Before I could say anything, Tracy stepped in and asked, Do you have anything interesting planned for tonight? Nothing exciting, was my reply. I ordered dinner in my room right before we called. It should be here soon. After dinner, I go to bed. Four days of meetings have worn me out. Honey, I'll be off tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. Assuming my flight arrives on time, I'll be back in Hartford at 3.40 and home by 5. Your itinerary's on the refrigerator. I know when you'll be home. Chris's reply made me think. It was two sarcastic comments in a row. I didn't say anything as Tracy was on the phone, deciding to talk to Chris and sort things out after I got home. I had to go. My dinner will be delivered soon. I love you both. Tracy, we'll talk more during the week, and I'll pick you up at the airport in two weeks. Chris, I'll see you tomorrow. I only heard a see you soon from my daughter and a good night from my husband before both of their faces disappeared from my laptop screen. I'll admit I was upset when I didn't hear the I love you statements from them that had ended all previous calls until recently. Maybe, I said to myself, they're just as tired as I am. Closing the computer, I got up, pulled my nightgown over my head, and threw it on the hotel bed. Then I went into the bathroom and spent a few minutes applying the minimum amount of makeup. At my age of 49, with shoulder-length blonde hair and blue eyes, most men would find me a very attractive woman. Chris calls me a 10 all the time, but after 27 years of marriage, he rather feels compelled to say it. I probably would have been given a nine the year we met at the University of Connecticut in my last year of college and third year of law school. But age creeps up, and now I would rate myself a solid eight out of ten and a sexy cougar. Standing naked in front of the full-length mirror, I pulled the ribbon out of my hair and let it cascade down my neck. After brushing my curls with my fingers and shaking my head, my hair looked perfect. I decided to wear a wonderful little black dress. It accentuates my 38D breasts and heart-shaped ass. My curves look amazing as the dress skims my hips and falls off three inches above my knees. And it goes without saying I'll be pantyless. The only forced solution is a bra. My partner wants me to go natural, but girls have started sagging. I think the black, sexy, see-through victory secret bra I bought especially for tonight will do very well. A few minutes later, I walk into the hotel restaurant with a smile and notice several male heads turning in my direction. I see Ted at a corner table, standing at a window that offers a view from the hotel's 11th floor of downtown Charlotte. Ted's smile turns into a beaming grin as I slip between the tables, heading in his direction. 
Ted Gleason was the son of the owner of the insurance agency that controlled the Cincinnati, Ohio market. We met nine years ago at one of the quarterly corporate meetings and became friends. Two years later, I slept with him, and we became bedmates and had sex at every quarterly meeting since. Ted is married and has five kids, all teenagers. Like me, he is on his way to taking over his father's agency when he retires. Ted is not bigger, prettier, or smarter than my husband. He's just 12 years younger than Chris and much quicker to recover, so he can have me again without wasting time making love. He had a vasectomy after my youngest son was born, which allows me to have sex with him without condoms. Ted stood up as I approached the table, kissed me on the cheek, and held my chair for me as I sat down. Everything okay at home? he asked. I'm a little bummed that the guys weren't on our general call and Chris was a little testy, but overall it's fine. Tracy had a good baby shower and she'll be coming home in two weeks for a shower of Harrington family and friends. How is your family doing? Ted came out of my room to give me privacy for the call and he called his family from a quiet part of the hotel lobby. All the kids are fine and I'm glad I'll be home tomorrow. Leanne was in a bad mood but I think she was just tired from taking care of the kids. When he finished, Ted nodded toward the red wine glass in front of me, raised his own, and said with a mischievous grin, here's to another great conference. As our glasses clinked, a third chair was placed at our table directly to my right. Looking up, I was so surprised at who I saw that the words just jumbled in my brain. Once seated, she said, hello, slut. How was your room service dinner? Tracy. Er yes, it was a question, even though I was looking at my pregnant daughter's face. Tracy. I exhaled again. What the hell are you doing here? Her smile couldn't have been more contemptuous when she answered. I didn't believe Daddy when he told us you were a lying, cheating whore. I had to come and see for myself. Tracy, honey, it's not what you think. I forced my heart to slow down and tried to focus on regaining my powers. Okay, slut, let me tell you what I think. Let's see if I'm wrong. I think all you did was lie during your 38-minute conversation with your family. I think you sleep with that shit stain, she pointed at Ted, at every one of your quarterly conferences. I think you crushed Dad. I think you've alienated your family. I think your parents would be ashamed to call you their daughter, and I think the chances of Grandpa's firm passing to you have been flushed down the toilet. As the tornado in my head reached the fifth grade level, Ted quickly stood up and announced, This is a family matter. I apologize and leave so you can deal with this situation in private. I didn't realize the situation could get any worse until Tracy smiled and said, I think a genius like you is going to want to sit down, shut up, and find out what kind of shit storm he's facing when he gets home to Leanne tomorrow. All the color left Ted's face. He's white as chalk. I'm not sure if he sat up or collapsed into a chair. Tracy turned to me and asked, Is that what you like about that shit stain? Is he a submissive asshole who does whatever he's told? The color quickly returned to Ted's face, which had turned tomato red at Tracy's insult. He pulled himself up, grabbed the table, and looked like he was going to lunge at Tracy. Tracy just laughed and said, Come on, shit stain. Touch one finger to my body seven months pregnant and go to jail. Ted immediately calmed down and regained his self-control, and Tracy continued. Please order me a glass of wine, shitstain. It won't take long. Tracy shifted in her chair and turned toward me, crossed her legs and folded her arms and placed them in her lap, then continued. I'd like to explain a few things to you, Mom. The reason my brothers have not been at the last few family calls is because they believed Dad and realized you were a lying whore. I don't know who cried harder that night when Daddy talked to us and told us about what you did. Jimmy, Johnny, and Daddy were sobbing at the end of the conversation. The only reason I didn't cry was because I was sure it was a huge mistake. The private investigator's report didn't convince me. Dad wouldn't show pictures or video, so I had to spend money I couldn't afford on plane tickets, a hotel room, and other necessary expenses to come here and see for myself. Tracy. Baby. I don't know what your father thinks he knows, but... Tracy's hand flew upward like a policeman stopping traffic. Don't you get it? Dad has proof. He has pictures and video from your hotel room. He has proof that my mother is a liar. 
He has proof that my mother is a liar. He has proof that my mother is another man's whore. With far more confidence than I felt, and with just as much false bravado, I hissed, We will work as a family, and we will get over this unfortunate incident. My daughter, mocking me, rolled her eyes and put her hand on her head, snapping her finger. Just then our waiter appeared. Tracy turned to him and said, I'm sorry, but I didn't call for you. That was a signal for another person. Tracy pointed to a tall and very well-built man who appeared behind the waiter. The man stood over Ted and asked, Are you Mr. Theodore Gleason? Yes, replied Ted in a trembling voice. The man continued, Mr. Gleason, you are being served. Throwing a large yellow envelope on the table, he turned to me. Are you Mrs. Gillian Harrington? With tears in my eyes, I nodded. Mrs. Harrington, you have been served. The same envelope was thrown in front of me. With a maniacal laugh, Tracy looked at Ted and told him, You don't have to open it. She pointed to the envelope. I'll tell you all about its contents. Leanne is divorcing your worthless ass. She's going to ask the court for your support in keeping the house until your youngest three-year-old Petey goes to college, as well as continued private Catholic school tuition for each of your children, and of course, alimony. Tracy looked around the fancy restaurant and continued. If I were you, I'd savor every bite of tonight's dinner. I suspect you'll be eating ramen noodles for most of the next two decades. Ted's eyes went blank and he hung his head in defeat when Tracy said, Oh, Teddy baby, and that's not all. You see, my daddy is a very smart lawyer. Besides getting free of you, Tracy nodded in my direction. His only goal is to screw up your life as much as possible. He's found a way to do that. Daddy looked into the prenuptial agreement protecting your 25% share in your father's agency. Hats off to your lawyers. The prenup is ironclad. Leanne can't put his finger on it. Smiling at Ted from ear to ear, she dropped the bombshell. Leanne can't touch your share, but my dad can. Alienation of affection lawsuits aren't recognized in Ohio, but they are recognized here in North Carolina. Since you've alienated your wife's love for a whore here in good old North Carolina, my daddy has filed a lawsuit in Charlotte and expects to win a fucking trial. Maybe he'll let you keep working as a janitor. Turning her attention back to me, Tracy smiled. You won't be as poor as shitty spot. Daddy splits everything in half with you. According to the prenup, daddy gets to keep his share of his law firm and the lake house in Vermont that he inherited from his grandparents. You get to keep your 40% share in Grandpa's insurance agency. However, Leanne is suing you in North Carolina for alienation of affection. She is pursuing you for ruining the lives of her five young children. Good luck. You're going to need it. The tears that began minutes ago intensified with each harsh word my daughter spoke. The lump in my stomach threatened to burst out and cover the white linen-covered table with vomit. How my life had gone from fairy tale to the darkest nightmare in a matter of minutes remained incomprehensible to me. Tracy reached out and took the glass of wine that had been ordered for her ages ago. Ted and I watched in silence as Tracy took several sips over the next few moments, seeming to savor the taste. When she set the unfinished glass back on the table, her tears flowed. The tears were as heavy as mine and rolled down her cheeks. I'm not coming home for the baby shower you planned. Please cancel it. That dozen words was an absolute shock to me and amplified ten times everything that had happened in the last 15 minutes. I could only stare with my mouth open as Tracy continued. And I don't want you to come to Atlanta after my daughter is born. I promise to send you pictures and updates, but until you get your life together, I don't want you to contact my family. As Tracy rose to her feet, a figure appeared beside her. It was her husband and my son-in-law, Brian. He put his arms around his sobbing wife, pulled her close, and quietly asked, Did you tell Mom the last part? Tracy shook her head. Tracy, he said in a loving but firm voice. I can't, she replied. Can you? Turning to me, Brian explained. I could be wrong, but I don't believe there is a way back to Chris. Your affair has lasted too long. There is a way back to your sons, to Tracy, to your granddaughter, and to me. It will take a lot of effort on your part, but we will be here when you become the other woman. We need you to be. 
Brian leaned over and kissed me gently on my crying cheek before leading a still crying Tracy away from the restaurant. A strange thought occurred to me as I watched them leave. I remembered the boxing matches Chris liked to watch, and I felt as if I'd taken an uppercut to the jaw and sprawled on the floor in the center of the boxing ring. Chris's story. How I managed to suppress my emotions for the past day and a half remained a mystery. I hadn't turned off the sound on my phone, and the ringing, buzzing, and buzzing had been almost nonstop since Tracy had seen her mother. Some of the messages were work-related. Most of the other text and voice messages and emails, however, came from family, friends, and Leanne Gleason. All were offering me support. The vast majority of the emails were from Jillian, and I immediately deleted every such message. I had conflicting emotions about Tracy's confrontation with Jillian and her jerk. From the beginning, when I told my children about their mother's betrayal and her years-long affair, Tracy was adamant that her mother could not be that kind of woman. Since I refused to provide my children with the full private investigator's report and accompanying recorded evidence, and instead sent each a short two-page outline, I had some doubts, at least about Tracy. Tracy and my son-in-law Brian hired an investigator from Charlotte. He was able to gain access to Jillian and the jerk's room and provided Tracy with the necessary evidence. Brian called me and informed me that Jillian had called American Insurance and explained that she was sick and would not be attending the last meeting. Charlotte confirmed that Jillian was able to get on an earlier flight and would arrive home around 1 p.m. the next day. I prepared for Jillian's return. Our house was jointly owned and I couldn't kick her out. It only took a few hours to pack up all of Jillian's belongings from the master bedroom and bath and move them into the guest room. I hired a handyman and installed new locks on the master bedroom door and my home office door. It wasn't much, but my divorce attorney made it clear to me that I couldn't do more than that. Immediately, I confessed that I did additionally something else. It was very childish, but grotesque. To the same degree of grotesque that Jillian's quarterly sex festivals seemed to me. I desperately wanted to leave Jillian with a visual impression of how I felt. Every day since Jillian left for Charlotte, I emptied my bowels in the morning in the bathroom connected to the guest bedroom and didn't flush. There were five piles of shit that would fill the toilet bowl above the water line. In fact, as I'd half-jokingly told Jillian hundreds of times, my waist smelled like petunias. Although I was prepared for the confrontation ahead, I cringed when I heard the garage door open. I was sitting in the fenced-in area of our backyard. We had built a small barbecue area and dining area, and farther to the left was a large pool surrounded by a concrete patio. Initially, I tried to landscape the area. The result was much worse than I had envisioned, so I hired a professional. Seven years later, our private grounds, filled with blooming flowers and lush greenery, could have easily been part of an article in Better Homes and Gardens magazine. Jillian and I were proud to host outdoor parties in the spring, summer, and early fall. I heard Jillian call out to me several times inside the house before the patio door opened and she stepped outside. She immediately spotted me sitting at the outdoor dining table, and as she came closer, she asked, Can I have a beer too? Sure, I replied. Unlike any other time she had asked, I remained seated and did not offer my services. With an almost silent snort, Jillian walked over to the outdoor refrigerator, found a craft beer, and poured it into a chilled glass. When she returned, she sat down across from me, took a sip of her beer, and said, I'm sorry. For a few moments, I studied her face. I noticed she had recently fixed her makeup, but it didn't hide her puffy eyes. She had been crying a lot. And what are you sorry about? Jillian clenched her jaws in irritation before she said, I'm sorry for hurting you, and I'm sorry for ruining my relationship with our children. Liar. Her nostrils flared as she leaned across the table and hissed, How dare you call me a- My body shuddered as I grinned, and Jillian stopped. How was your dinner in your room last night? That's lie number one. How many more of the 10,000 or so instances of lying do you want me to list? We silently appraised each other and each took a sip of beer. Nevertheless, she continued, I'm sorry. There was an awkward silence again before I replied, Okay, I apologize. After a few more moments, I continued with a shrug. I don't care. You don't care about our family? For Christ's sake, Jillian. Tracy is married and living in Atlanta. She's starting her own family. 
Jim is starting his career at a top engineering firm in Albany. John will graduate from Fordham University in June and has already told us that he is staying in New York and wants to work on Wall Street. We've done a great job and our kids are wonderful people, but they don't need us now the way they used to. But we have to support them, Jillian almost screamed. And we will. Each of us will support them to the best of our ability. Unfortunately, each of us will do it alone. Jillian tried to interrupt me, but I continued. You have been a good mother, and I have not the slightest doubt that you will continue to give each of our children the support they need. However, you fail to be a loving and faithful wife. I don't like you. I don't trust you. I don't respect you. I will fight the divorce, she declared. Of course you will. You'll fight because you're a selfish bitch and you don't care about me. This time, the silence lasted a few minutes. We were each deep in our own thoughts. Why did you bring the kids in so early? Jillian finally asked. I needed them to provide DNA samples. I had to make sure I was their biological father. Jillian's eyes nearly popped out of their sockets. So rounded were they. You couldn't believe that I... For the second time, Jillian couldn't finish her sentence. I know for a fact that you're a lying, cheating whore. I just don't know when it started or how many men have slept with you, I said with a shrug. And since I don't believe a word you say, I'll never know the answers to those questions. But I now know with 100% certainty that all three of our children are mine. The paternity tests prove it. My laughter was completely unexpected. I leaned across the table toward Jillian. Just so you know, I told her in my most menacing voice, if I found out that any of our children weren't mine, you'd be lying in the trunk of my car right now, and I'd be driving to Vermont to bury your corpse in the middle of the woods. My unexpected statement stunned us both, but seemed to amuse my guest who was emerging from our pool. Light splashes and hoarse laughter made Jillian turn around. What the fuck are you doing here? shouted Jillian angrily. Hi, Jilly. Welcome home, Mickey replied with a smile. Burying her dead body? Where did that come from? It was a rhetorical question, and we both watched Mickey. Me with great appreciation and growing confidence, and Jillian with rapidly increasing rage. Jillian and Mickey had been best friends since their freshman year at the University of Connecticut. They had lived together since sophomore year, talked to each other almost every day, and never missed a chance to get together for coffee or something stronger or to eat. Every week. Mickey was a nurse by training and was currently the director of nursing, chief nursing officer, at Hartford's largest hospital. Mickey had divorced her cheating husband almost four years ago, and Jillian and I supported our friend at every opportunity. Both women were taller than 5'10", with very beautiful faces and bodies that could seduce a priest. However, there were some significant differences. Jillian was sexy and lush, while Mickey's body was lean and athletic. Jillian had large breasts with large, equally brown areolas and nipples, while Mickey possessed firm, small breasts topped with perky pink ones. Both had firm and round asses, but Jillian's ass was bigger, and Mickey's buttocks could fit in each of my hands. You're probably wondering how I knew Mickey's deepest bodily secrets. It's a fair question. You see, Mickey had gotten dressed thinking about her upcoming confrontation with her friend. She was topless. She was only wearing a thong, but it wasn't a bathing suit thong. It was Jillian's black see-through underwear that matched the bra she wore for her lover. And since Mickey had just climbed out of the pool, it was very easy to see every corner of her sexy body. Mickey walked over to the fridge, grabbed a beer and plopped down next to me and took a few sips. You told him? Jillian shrieked. Mickey took another big sip before answering. I'm ashamed to admit it but it took me almost two days to decide to tell Chris everything, and another two days to arrange a meeting with him. I'm sure I did the right thing in telling my friend about your betrayal. You're a fucking traitor. We've been friends for over 30 years. Well, Mickey sighed, all good things come to an end. After a short pause, she continued, I doubt it will make any difference, but Chris knew before I did that you're a nasty slut. Jillian shifted her gaze back to me. Leanne Gleason told me. I explained. Turns out your asshole gave his wife an STD. 
She was able to pull strings through family members and got the cure from him without reporting it through official channels. She hired a private investigator and stopped having sex with him. It didn't take me long to find out about your long-term affair with him, as well as his several other fleeting affairs with other married whores. Jillian flinched as I continued. Leanne and I kept in touch, and I hired a detective when you both attended an industry conference in Washington last month. That's when I got the disgusting photos and video for my divorce attorney. I've been planning our divorce ever since. When did you two start sleeping together? Jillian asked. You worthless pig, Mickey exploded. Do you even know your husband? I wanted to. Oh, God, I tried to seduce him. But he wouldn't touch me, and he won't until your divorce is finalized. Mickey stood up, leaned across the table, and got as close to Jillian as she could before telling her, Once the divorce is official, I'll have him all day, every day, until he gets sick of me. And I promise you, he will never get bored of my body. Mickey turned to me, held out her hand, and said, You promised me lunch, stud. Taking her hand, I took one last look at Jillian. I wanted to end our conversation with one last sarcastic comment, but all I saw in her eyes was pain and defeat. I remembered those stupid YouTube videos of a guy getting kicked in the balls. Epilogue. To no one's surprise, Jillian eventually kept her promise and fought her divorce. The mandatory marriage counseling lasted three sessions. I participated because it was court-ordered. There, Dr. Cohen was almost begging me. Please, I'd like you to tell me about one thing. I'd like you to tell me about one thing, saving grace for your marriage. It didn't take me long to answer. We had and raised wonderful children. Everyone around me smiled until I continued. It's a shame that she hates her children so much that she destroyed our family. That was the end of our sessions, and eight months later, our marriage was officially dissolved. I remember pacing back and forth in the house the night I received the court order. Around 8.15 p.m., there was a knock on the door. When I opened the door, Mickey was standing on the porch, dressed in a knee-length raincoat. She quickly looked around, making sure my neighbors weren't walking their dogs, and dropped the raincoat on the porch. She wasn't wearing anything underneath. Mickey and I were sex buddies for the next few months. The sex was incredible, but a strange thing happened. I considered her my best friend when I was married to Jillian. It seemed like we were missing something in sex, and our close friendship just changed. Four or five months after our wonderful but emotionally flawed sex began, Mickey called me. Hey, Stallion, can you take a pretty little slut out to dinner on Friday? I laughed and replied, your wish is law. A few seconds of silence ensued. I was about to think the connection had broken when Mickey said, I'm bringing my big sister. I want you to meet her. Meet your sister? I've known Jen for decades. I heard Mickey sigh and confess. She's perfect for you, Chris. I heard an almost soundless sob as she finished speaking. The silence between us lasted much longer this time. Mickey's continued crying and my occasional grumbling let us know that the call wasn't over yet. Eventually, I made the decision for both of us. You can bring Jen Mickey as long as I'm with a buddy. He's perfect for you. By the time the waiter brought appetizers to our table, I was absorbed in my conversation with Jen, and Mickey and Kevin had forgotten we existed. Jen and I met two or three times a week, and we went out with Mickey and Kevin once or twice a month. I quickly fell head over heels in love with Jen, and I realized from the affectionate looks Kevin and Mickey gave me that they were in love too. To top it all off, Mickey was back to best friend status. Mickey and Kevin were married in a traditional church ceremony eight months later. Another six weeks later, Jen and I followed them in a much more casual beach ceremony. We were joined by six children, their families, and a small group of close friends. I hadn't seen Jillian in three years. We met at my son Jim's wedding, and Jillian was with her husband Michael. Two years later, John got married, and Jillian came with her husband, Claude. Sadly, Jillian's parents both died together in an automobile accident. At their funeral, Jillian's fourth husband, Anthony, told me that my eulogy was a great tribute to her parents.